Good evening and welcome to Phoenix Fellowship Live. I'm Pastor Daryl Chilson. Tonight we're going to begin a series of studies that seek to answer the question, perhaps a question that you have heard and have even thought of yourself. Is there anything in the Bible that tells us about what we are going through as a world right now? Is there anything that would answer the question, where is God in this picture and what is ahead? What is it that we can expect? Does the Bible speak to this issue? We're going to attempt to answer that in the series of studies that we're going to be doing beginning tonight. And I would like to begin with prayer. Father in heaven, tonight I pray that your spirit will lead our minds, our understanding, give us, give us, Lord, an ability to see life on this earth as you see it today. In Jesus' name, amen. So the Bible tells us all about the first coming of Jesus. You can go throughout the Old Testament there's prophecy after prophecy that tells of his first advent. He wanted the nation of Israel to know that he was coming and when he was coming, but there are very few that are mentioned in the Bible that seem to know and understand that his first advent was near. People simply missed it. The Bible tells us that Jesus is coming again. Throughout the New Testament, we have not, not only Old Testament, but New Testament too, especially throughout the New Testament, we have the promise of his return. And we have prophecies that tell us of the signs that we can look for. They will tell us that his coming is approach, approaching. Tonight, I want to look at one particular prophecy that comes to us in the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, tell the story of Jesus' life here on earth from beginning to end, from Bethlehem to Calvary to the resurrection. They tell the story of Jesus from his baptism to his ministry. They tell of his love for the sinner, and they even record very strong and stern words against the leaders of Israel who were very self-righteous and self-centered and rejecting of him as the Messiah. There is one particular passage in the book of Matthew, which is also recorded in Luke and Mark, the parallel gospels, the synoptic gospels, there is one passage in the book of Matthew that we're going to look at tonight that tells us what Jesus had to say about the end of the world. Sometimes people are afraid of Bible prophecy or they might feel as if there have been so many people that have talked about it that nobody really knows what's going to happen in the future. Nobody really knows how to interpret the scriptures and the prophecies of the Bible as they pertain to that which is ahead, that which is future. So the thing is, Jesus wanted us to know. God wants us to know what's ahead. He told us that he wants us to know what's coming. And these words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 help us to understand where we are in time and what we can expect in the future. I want to quote just one verse in Matthew chapter 24, where after Jesus has given us the prophecies that we're going to study tonight, he says to us in Matthew 24, verse 33, when you see all these things, know that my coming is near. He wants us to know. And then in John chapter 16, which takes place the night 
It's a recording. It's a record of the words that Jesus spoke to his disciples the night he was arrested, hours before his death. In John chapter 16, Jesus is telling his disciples, he's trying to prepare them for what's coming. Not just for that weekend, not just for that next day when they would find him on the cross and wonder why he was there. They would flee afraid that they had been wrong about who he was. And they would, they would be afraid, they would lock themselves into their homes for fear of the Jews coming to get them as well. It was, they didn't know. Jesus had told them throughout his ministry that these things were going to happen, but they didn't know. The record is so clear. He says, I am going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be crucified. I will raise in three days, and you need to know. And of course, the disciples are thinking about other things, apparently, because they didn't pick it up. They didn't understand. But on this night before his death, he is not only now trying to prepare them for what's coming the next day. He's trying to prepare them for what they're going to go through in the years to come. And he says to them, you are going to be treated as I'm being treated and I will be treated tonight. People will try to kill you too. They will come and persecute you as well. But he says to them in verse 4, John 16 and verse 4, but these things I have told you that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. So Jesus wanted us to know by the signs of his coming that he talks about in Matthew 24. He wants us to know when the time is near. And he wants us to remember those things, perhaps which we are studying tonight and in the weeks to come, that we well, we will recognize them when they begin to happen. He says, I want you to remember that I told you. In verses 12 and 13 of the same chapter, John chapter 16, Jesus is talking to his disciples still, and he says to them, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, and he will tell you the things to come. The Spirit of God will show us, too, those things which are to come, as Jesus promised he would do for the disciples. Sometimes the things that Jesus said were not clear, and sometimes intentionally so. I think of the, the instance in John chapter 2, where Jesus has just cleansed the temple. John chapter two, it talks about him cleansing the temple, going in and turning over the tables of the money changers and chasing them out of the temple. And when he was done, the Jews wanted to know, by what authority do you do these things? Who gave you the right to do these things? Give us a sign, they said. Give us a sign. And what did he say in verse 12, in verse uh, 19? He says in, in John 2, John 2, I'm looking, John 2, 19 to 20. Jesus answered them and said to them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now, if you were standing there in the crowd that day, what would you think? Would you think that he was talking about the, the beautiful temple that was standing there in the background? Well, of course you would. You wouldn't think that he was speaking of the temple of his body, as it says in the next verse. Sometimes the things that Jesus said were covered with a cloak of mystery. He didn't say things right out sometimes, and sometimes they were unclear. And sometimes Bible prophecy seems to be the same way. We have to pull back 
a veil. We have to uncover the things that are told to us about the things that are yet future. I think of the, the text in, in Daniel chapter 12, and we will be going to Daniel to study some prophecies in Daniel to prepare us for an understanding of Revelation in a couple of weeks. But here's what God told Daniel when Daniel said, after all of these prophecies were given to him, when are these things going to take place? How am I going to know? How are we going to know? What is the end of these things, he says in verse 8. Chapter 12, verse 8. And God answers him by saying, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. There are some things that we are not to know until the end of time. But I believe that we're living in that era of history. I believe that we are approaching the coming of Jesus Christ. And I also believe that the prophecies that were intended for the end of time can be understood. I know that to be true. I believe that with all my heart, and I intend to help you discover the things that are hidden between that light cover, of that light cloud of mystery that has been over the book of Revelation in the past. To me, God wants us to know in fact, in the book of Revelation, in the book of Revelation itself, it starts right out by saying, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is the revelation, not the, not the secret, not the mystery, not something it isn't to be understood. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants. He is showing us. He is opening the veil so that we can see those things which must shortly take place. And it says in the last part, or in verse three, it says, blessed is he who reads the book of Revelation and understands those who read and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. Revelation is not a mystery. Revelation was written so that God's servants, you and I as Christians, will know, will understand those things that are to take place. So, now I'm talking about everything except Matthew 24. We said at the on start, at the beginning, that we would be studying Matthew 24. Why Matthew 24? Matthew 24 is the only passage, along with Mark 13 and, Mark, and Luke 21 that are parallel passages, Matthew 24 is the only passage in the Gospels and in the New Testament that has no cloak, no mystery hanging over it. Jesus here speaks clearly. And Matthew 24 is the template on which we place all the other prophecies of Scripture. The book of Revelation, the prophecies of Revelation, and there are other places in the Scriptures. Daniel speaks of the time of the end as well. And Matthew 24 is the discourse that Jesus gave on the Tuesday afternoon before his death during Passion Week. Jesus is leaving, leaving the temple for the last time. Yes, he will be back in Jerusalem for the trials and the mock, mock, mockery of a trial and for the accusations to face his accusers, to be beaten, to be spit upon, to have a crown of thorns put on his head and finally to be crucified. He will be back in Jerusalem. But this is his last time Tuesday evening before his death, that he will actually be at the temple teaching and speaking to the leaders and to the people who are listening. Matthew 24, in that chapter, Jesus clearly, clearly, 
tells us with no mysterious words, no hidden thoughts, no nothing hidden. He clearly speaks to us about the things that would happen from that day, that Tuesday before his death, until his second return. This prophecy, this prophecy is the basis of understanding all end time prophecies. All eschatology, the study of the end time, all eschatology is based on Matthew 24. Let me illustrate. I wanna take you to a slide which is a watermark, and some of you have seen watermarks before. Uh, they're an interesting technical uh, thing that a person can do in, in like Word documents and other, perhaps other, uh, other platforms. But you can actually take an image and put it on a page and make that the page on which you write other things. Matthew 24, I've just put on this slide a watermark that you can see. You can actually make it so you can hardly see it. It's faded if you want to. And most of you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm probably over explaining this, but it's, it's important for us to recognize that Matthew 24 is like a watermark, a watermark over which all prophecies that have to do with the end time can be superimposed and we can see through them and some of the mysterious wording and the imagery of those prophecies, we can see through them this clearly stated discourse, this stated prophecy of Jesus in Matthew 24. In fact, in our next study, we're going to be studying Revelation 6. And we have another slide with a, the same watermark representing the story of Jesus as, and we will read this in just a moment, the story of Jesus as he and his disciples are leaving the temple and leaving Jerusalem going across the Kidron Valley and up the Mount of Olives, looking back and seeing the temple. That's the picture that you see in the background. That's simply representative of the prophecy of Matthew 24 that Jesus gives us in that passage. But in Revelation 6, and I've just put a couple of verses on there for you to see. In Revelation 6, we can actually set Revelation 6 right on top of Matthew 24, and we see a perfect parallel. Now we're taking imagery from Revelation and putting it on a clearly stated prophecy of Jesus in Matthew 24, and all of a sudden it shows through, and we can understand the things that are spoken of in Revelation chapter six. Let me use another illustration. Our next slide is a picture of, on one side, a skeleton. And on the other side is a picture of that skeleton with meat on it. It has organs, it has it muscles, it has um, ar arterial uh, veins and arteries, it has nerves running through it, it ha it's been fleshed out, the same skeleton has had meat put on it and life put on it. Now we still don't see that exterior of the person that might be represented by that, that image, but we see something much more than what we see in the first skeleton, and this the first image, the picture of the skeleton. This is like Matthew 24, being the skeleton and the other prophecies that have to do with the time of the end being placed upon this skeleton to flesh out what Jesus told us in Matthew 24. It's just a good illustration of how prophecy can come to life when, all, when at first you look at it and you just, all you see is pictures of beasts and images and, and language that you simply don't understand. 
now as we set it on top of this template of Matthew 24, all of a sudden it comes to life. It means something. Don't forget in our study and in your study of the prophecies of the Bible, particularly in reference to the end of time, don't forget that Matthew 24 is the basis for understanding all the rest. So let's go to Matthew 24. Let's go to Matthew 24, the first three verses. And in, that, in those verses, we see the, um, we see the uh, setting that I have already just spoken to you about. It says in Matthew 24 and verse 1, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple for the last time, Tuesday afternoon before his death. And his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. It's very likely that the sun, as it was going down in the west, was showing its its rays upon the temple and making it so beautiful as it sparkled in the sunlight. And so they say to him, look, Lord, look at the temple, how beautiful it is. And Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Surely I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. This is a prophecy that actually came through just under 40 years later as Jerusalem was surrounded by Roman armies, invaded, and the temple was raised to the ground. Every stone, not one stone was left upon another. It says in verse 3, now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, get this now, there are three questions in this one question, three questions. Tell us what will be the sign of your coming? Because they equated the destruction of the temple with the coming of Christ. What will be, when will these things be, first of all? Tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Three questions. When will these things be when the stones of the temple are not left one upon another? When will we know that you are coming? What are the signs? What will be the signs of your coming? And finally, what, how will we know? What are the signs of the end of the age? And Jesus answered all three questions as one in the verses that follow. Let's look at Matthew 24, verses four to six. And in these verses, we see, and we'll read these together. In these verses, we see pre-apocalyptic events. Apocalyptic, having to do with the end of time, having to do with all of the events that are associated with the coming of Christ. Pre-apocalyptic, that's what we will use as a term to describe the events that are described in Matthew 24, verses 4 to 6. Let's read together. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. So the events that take place that are described in those three verses are events that describe life throughout history. There have been wars and rumors of wars. There have been, um, there have been 
people coming in the name of Christ, sometimes maybe not calling themselves Christ, but coming in his name and saying things that are inaccurate and misrepresent him. Watch out for those people, he says, for they will deceive many. Those things have happened throughout history. Perhaps even you can think of examples in our day when we have seen individuals seeming to represent Christ and really representing themselves. Those things he said will happen. But notice, notice the last phrase. But the end is not yet. So all of the things which follow have to do with things that come as we approach the coming of Christ. He makes clear that life on this earth is as it is described in those verses, verses four to six. But now let's look at verses seven through 14. Seven through 14 shows us a picture of what will happen soon before Jesus comes, soon. These are the beginning of sorrows, it says. These are the beginning of sorrows. And so let's read that together, beginning with verse seven. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. That almost sounds like what he was saying in verse uh, six, where he talks about wars and rumors of wars, but it's different. We have now entered into a new phase of time in these verses, and you will see that as we go. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in various places. All these, he says, are the beginning of sorrows. This is a time of trouble that comes before Jesus returns. And then notice how this time it affects the people of God. He actually tells us, and I don't want to dwell on this because it's, it's just that you need to see it and know that the people of God will go through a very difficult time during this period of time of trouble before, as you will see in a couple of minutes, the great tribulation, which comes beginning with verse 15. But let's look at this time of trouble that is described here. He says, they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. There's a reason for that. There's a reason for that that we're actually going to study in more depth next study. And then many will be offended and will betray one another and they'll hate one another. There's animosity between people, between God's people and others at this time. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. A little bit like before, right? And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But, he who endures to the end shall be saved. And next verse is very important because all of these things take place as the spread of the gospel as scripture portrays it. It abounds through the earth. And there's imagery in Revelation 6 that will describe that even in more detail. Verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. Notice, I want you to notice this. In verse 6, where Jesus is describing, don't forget, this is the template of Bible prophecy, the template of eschatology, that which has to do with end times. This is the template. Notice in the end of verse six, Jesus says, but the end is not yet. The word end is used, but the end is not yet. But in verse 13, during this time of trouble, it shows 
that that period of time goes to the end. He endures, who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world, and then the end will come. Those words, end, are so important in helping us to see the pattern that is being developed here by Jesus in this discourse. And so, what do we see during the time of trouble? Let's look at it. Let's look at the breakdown, Matthew 24 breakdown. Let's look at this. A time of trouble. What do we see? The sword, famine, pestilence, earthquake, persecution, betrayal and death, false prophets and teachers, lawlessness, loss of conscience, and, and the gospel goes to all the world before the end comes. Now you might think that the gospel has already gone to the whole world. It has not. It has not gone to the world. Not only because not everyone has heard what the Christian church has to say, but not the whole Christian church has the gospel straight. That's true. It isn't just Jesus loves you. Isn't that wonderful? And he loves sinners. Isn't that wonderful? And Jesus came to save you. Isn't that wonderful? There are specific elements of the gospel that are being left out of the message of the church to the world, which is why the world is not being turned upside down by the voice of the church as it was in the first century. And we will talk about the gospel at a later point. But this is key to understanding that the gospel, as the scriptures portray it, will go to the entire world before Jesus comes. It will go to the entire world. And then Jesus says in verse 14, then the end will come. Now let's go to verses 15 onward as we look at the next segment, the next tier. I'm going to call it the next tier. We could call it the next wave, as we will illustrate later. The next tier of this prophecy. First, we have, and we will see this on a slide in a moment. Not yet, but we will see it shortly. First, we have, actually, we did see that slide. It's the breakdown. It's the slide. I wonder if we could pull up slide seven again. It's the slide that shows categories of time, the pre-apocalyptic time. Then there is a second tier that is the time of trouble. This is another complete section that ends at the end of time. And then somewhere along during this time of trouble, we have a third tier that comes into the picture. And that's what we're going to read about next. It starts out in verse 15. And then we have a final tier at the very end. And we will show this slide at the end of our study so that you can see how this all plays out. But right now, let's go to Matthew 24, beginning with verse 15, the text of that passage. This is the third tier of the discourse that Jesus is giving us, each tier ending at the same time, ending with the end of time. This is a pattern. Just recognize this is a pattern that we see throughout the book of Revelation, which we actually see in Daniel as well, and we will see that as we study some of Daniel's chapters and prophecies as well. But let's look at verse 15, because this now is the beginning of the third tier, which starts somewhere during the time of the second tier, the time of trouble. This is what the Bible says. This is what Jesus said. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place. Daniel? Jesus is referring to Daniel as well. 
because Daniel gives us some clear understanding of things that will happen from the time that he lived until the time that Jesus comes. Again, we will see some pieces of prophecy that all fit together with the prophecies of Jesus in this chapter. So, Jesus says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, and then Matthew writes, whoever reads, let him understand. This is important, he says. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now, all of a sudden you say, wait a minute, this is Judea. It's talking about Judea, it's talking about Israel. Yes, it is talking about Israel. And when we study the destruction of Jerusalem, we will see that this same abomination of desolation stands in the holy place at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem as well. The story of the destruction of Jerusalem, remember, remember the disciples asked three questions in one. In their minds, they probably all thought it was the same, but in but Jesus answered all three questions. And the first question was, when will it be that not one stone will be left upon another? That's in reference to the destruction of Jerusalem, the story of the destruction of Jerusalem. So this is applicable to the first century. It's also applicable to the end of time, as you will see as we continue to read. It is a parallel prophecy. The destruction of Jerusalem is a miniature story of the end of time. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath day. And why? Why? Verses, verses 21 and following tell us why. For there then will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect, who are the elect? The people of God. For the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. And we continue. If anyone, Jesus says, then if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or there, do not believe it, He's leading up to, he's leading up to, verse 27, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, the very elect. That's why Jesus told us to watch and be ready. Watch, know these things that are coming. So when they come and when they begin to take place, we will recognize that they fit into the picture of all the events that will take place before he returns. And verse 25, see, I have told you beforehand. He wants us to know. Therefore, if they say to you, Look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. Why? And where are we in time right now? In this passage, where are we in time? What's the next verse say? Verse 27. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. What did the disciples ask Jesus? They said, when will these things take place? When will there be not one stone left upon another? 
What will be the signs of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus is answering all three of those questions in this passage. What will happen? The abomination of desolation. And we'll talk about what that is at some point in time, not tonight, not tomorrow night, or not the next study, but soon there will be an identification of what the abomination of desolation is. He wants us to know there will be great tribulation. There will be false Christs, false prophets, and they will do things that are beyond our explanation as signs to prove that they are legitimate prophets. They are legitimate representatives of God, and it will not be so. There will be false Christs, false prophets with deceptive signs and wonders. And then what? The end. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming in the clouds of heaven. Let's go to, to Matthew 24, beginning with verse 29. Look at this incredible description that follows. Verse 29 says, Immedi this is tier four. Get this, remember that slide that we showed? Pre-apocalyptic times, the time of trouble, which is like a wake-up time of trouble. Then there is the great tribulation. And then now we are at tier four. Each one beginning after the other has begun. Each one starting at some point in the middle of the previous tier, all of them ending with the end word and with the coming of Christ, the end of the age, the coming of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days. You see, it puts it clearly in, in context of time. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, Literally, the moon will not give its light. Literally, the stars will fall from heaven. Literally, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Revelation talks about these events. Now we know where to put them when we see them in the book of Revelation. And finally, in verse 30 and 31, then, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. Oh, we, we read about that in Thessalonians chapter 4, verse Thessalonians 4. There's the sound of a trumpet. And these angels will gather together the people of God wherever they are from one end of the earth to the other. He will gather them together. And what does Paul say in 1 Thessalonians 4? And they will meet him in the clouds and return to those mansions that Jesus promised his disciples in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, where he says, Let not your heart be troubled. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. What a picture. This is how it ends. And these words that we have read and studied tonight help us understand how we get there. The things that we have to see happening in our earth before Jesus comes. Now I would like to use one more illustration. I've used the watermark illustration. We've used the skeleton illustration of where the, the other prophecies of the Bible fill out the flesh on the skeleton one more 
illustration I want to use, and I have included in this slide the breakdown of Matthew 24 so that you can see these waves that come one right after the other, and yet all are contiguous with the rest. They are all part of one ocean, all part of one movement toward the shoreline, which we might liken to the coming of Christ. All these waves, one after the other coming, these segments of prophecy, these tiers of prophecy that we have looked at in Matthew 24 tonight, come like waves, all connected, all connected, yet beginning one after the other until they all end up on the shore. Lastly, in Matthew 24, I just want to read to you what Jesus says in verses 42 and 44. You see, I don't ever want to be accused of someone who's setting time or dates. I can't do that. The Bible says that only the Father knows the day and the hour of Jesus' return, only him. I'm sure that Jesus knows at some point, maybe he knows now, I don't know. But there is no time setting. I'm not saying that anything happening today is exact fulfillment of these prophecies. I want to tell you what the Bible says. And when you see them happening, then as the Spirit of God awakens your mind and heart, you will know, it's like, like Jesus said, when they come to pass, you will remember that I told you, and you will know that my coming is even at the door. I want to show you from the scriptures in the next few weeks the what is going to happen and allow the Holy Spirit to show you when it is happening or will happen. But we see this instruction from Christ that comes in verse 42 and 44 of this same chapter. He says, watch therefore, watch therefore. Therefore, on the basis of all that I have told you, he says to his disciples and to us through them, Watch, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Verse 44, therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. The things that take place before Jesus comes will come as a surprise. He says so in the Bible. I'll read you that verse sometime. It says they will be a surprise. They will take us off guard. We will not expect them. We do not know when these times will come. But if we're watching and we know what's coming from what Jesus has told us and the other, the other prophecies of the end time, we will be ready. We will know and be ready. And how are we ready? Well, that's what the gospel is all about. The gospel tells us those things which we need to understand so that we will be ready. And when Jesus returns in the clouds of heaven, what a sight that's going to be. And it says in the scriptures that those who are his will look up into the heavens and they will say, Lo, this is our God we have waited for him, and he will save us. Note that, that affirmation of certainty. He will save us. This is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. What a thing to be able to say on the day that Jesus returns. I want you to be ready, and we are going to spend time in these next few weeks studying not only the prophecies, but things that you can understand that will help you know that if Jesus were to come today, 
If he were to come tomorrow, we know he can't because a lot of things have not happened yet that he said will happen. If he were to come today or tomorrow, you can have the assurance that you will be one of those that he takes back with him to the place he has prepared for you. Next week, we're going to study Revelation 6. Next study will be Revelation 6. And we're going to put that prophecy, that passage, right on top of Matthew 24, and it too will come alive. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the revelation of Jesus Christ in it, not only as our Lord and Savior, but the revelation of those things which are to come. I pray, Lord, that every ear in my hearing, every person within the hearing of my voice will continue to join us as we study these things so that they too will be watching and ready when you return. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.